cognitive decline are now the leading cause of death. Some people call it Alzheimer's disease, but there's uh, Alzheimer's disease, is, as it was originally described as probably a genetic early onset Alzheimer's disease, you might, a familial Alzheimer's disease. Whereas what most people have is this late onset Alzheimer's disease, which may actually not be the same thing. And, it, and in my mind, it's a continuous onslaught of the brain from the environment factors and a lack of protective inputs. So if you think about things that are protective and beneficial for the brain, we've talked about exercise. I think the first time, so first in, in rodents and then in humans, the first time we saw that we can actually increase the size of an important area of the brain later in life uh, was the hippocampus. So the hippocampus is an area of the brain that's very important in memory. It's definitely effect, or you're significantly affected in people with dementia uh, or cognitive decline, Alzheimer's disease. And an older population, I think they were in their 60s. They had them just do brisk walking three times a week for a year. I think it was 45 minutes. And there was a control group who did some stretching for the same period of time. And in the brisk walking group, and again, when I talk about cardiovascular exercise, aerobic exercise, that's what I mean. I mean, going for a brisk walk, like it doesn't need to be more intense than that. But that group saw an increase in the size of their hippocampus, which would normally decrease in size with age. And it was the first time that we ever saw in humans, in adult humans, older adult humans, that an area of the brain can increase in size. And so exercise is incredibly important. Again, resistance training has similar effects, but seems to affect more the white matter, which is the part of the brain that's really there for fast connection, sort of connecting all the different parts of the brain and sending signals. And so both aspects, as we might separate them out, aerobic and strength are, are important for the brain. And then the challenge aspects, which we talk about, I think this is one of the probably the most, I guess, forgotten important part of what it takes to make and keep a healthy brain. And again, let's use athlete analogy, which is that if you stop training, or for some reason, you become immobilized, your muscles, and you have a good amount of muscle, you're an athlete, right? Or you say break your leg and it goes in a cast. When you take that cast off, you'll see the leg on that size is smaller, You've lost muscle mass on that size. So anytime you stop um, sort of giving an input, a stimulus to the muscles, they will reduce in size because it's energetically expensive. If you don't need them, your body isn't going to keep it, isn't going to keep it around. And everything, all the evidence that exists today suggests that your, the brain is the same, right? Use it or lose it. And when we think about using the brain, um, again, I, I like to compare back to what it takes to create and build a brain in the first place. So as an infant, you are doing things like learning to talk, learning social interaction, social cues, um, learning to control this fabulously complicated meat suit with incredible dexterity. And those things take a huge amount of, of neurological uh, stimulus, input, and effort. Then throughout life, um, you, may, you start to do things that you may think are hard, but compared to that, really not that hard, like biochemistry as an undergrad or learning to drive a car um, or you know, the, the, the ins and outs of your job, right? They feel hard, but in terms of the stimulus and the, the, the effort required from your nervous system, it's actually quite small compared to, say, how, learning how to control your whole body. And as we get older, we just do the same things again and again. They get easier for us. They just become habits. They become patterns, which don't require again, any significant cognitive input. And because of that, you're essentially telling your brain, hey, I don't need you to be as complex as you once were because we're not doing anything difficult. Um, and you see multiple different strands that, that, that kind of um, come into this. So uh, people have probably heard about the knowledge, right? London cab drivers, you know, less so now if, if, uh, if, if Uber continues to be allowed to exist. But to be a, a, a black cab driver in London, you had to learn the knowledge originally, which is um, all of the streets in a six mile radius of Charing cross. And they once looked at brain scans of people taking the knowledge or learning it before and after. And those who passed, and, and again, we don't know why they passed, whether it was because they were the ones who actually studied or, you know, they have some other, some other skills that allowed them to be able to gain the knowledge. Those who passed, again, saw an increase in size in certain aspects of the brain on a brain scan. And those who didn't pass the knowledge didn't become capital drivers, didn't. So you've, you've created this incredibly difficult stimulus, which has then, you know, helped uh, improve the brain. Um, and you see something similar in terms of people who retire earlier tend to die earlier as well. And that's after you're adjusting for all the things that might cause you to retire earlier, such as medical conditions. So again, like telling the body, telling the brain that it's required um, 
it is incredibly powerful for, for brain health. And you know, we could go on. So if you look at the brain, if you look at the brain health or the brain age of musicians, amateur musicians have a better brain age than professional musicians because amateur musicians, it's harder for them, right? They have to work harder to get um, a, a, a nice result. So, so all of this is basically telling me that in order to keep your brain healthy, you need to tell tell your brain that it's needed. That requires you to do difficult things, which is going to also require you to be bad at stuff as you learn new skills. Um, and then once, you, once you've acquired a new skill, you then have to move on to something else. I mean, still do the thing if you enjoy it. But then if, as soon as something becomes habit, becomes patterned, becomes easy, it's no longer the same stimulus. So this could be anything. It could be dancing. It could be some kind of movement or sport. It could be singing. Um, teaching others uh, it seems to be uh, pr- a protective as well. Uh, knitting. Um, I recently started to learn how to code on, on my computer because you know that was something that's beneficial for my job, but also incredibly difficult. I'd never done anything like it before. So there are all these things that you can do, uh, but you need some kind of ongoing stimulus uh, to, to tell your brain that it's that still needed, it's still worth keeping around. Um, and, and that's something that, that you'll, you'll essentially need for as, for as long as you want your brain to, to still be working. 